Hi everyone! Okay. Getting a few things started over here, including my tea. Because this cold is still, still present, unfortunately. So I will beg all of your patience today while I muddle through this a little bit. Like, warning for lots- oh no, this doesn't fit in my little holder. Okay, well, we'll just- Crap! Where do I put my mug? Okay, there we go. And yes, visibly, welcome back, and hello also to, let's see, Strawberry Jesus, Cassie, Triumphant Bass, Onad, Nito Dios, Hacker, Is Brick, and Visibly Twitching. Hello, everyone, and Hend 3 d Um, and Matt, hi, MC Childs. Uh, let's see, this is still like, I have this turned down super far, but it's like blasting the Christmas music. Christmas! All right, so welcome back to day three? Linear logistic, yes, day three of uh, Christmas death metal. No, not Christmas death metal. Um, <laughs> of machine learning miss, our celebration of the 12 days of machine learning. And today we're gonna be doing uh, classification. And so we did some classification yesterday, actually. So you've gotten a little bit of a preview. Um, just so everybody can see it, let's take a look really quick at the schedule. So as you can see, we are right on schedule. I'm being good. I haven't had to postpone or reschedule anything, even if that means I'm gonna be sneezing repeatedly during stream. <laughs> uh, so we've covered linear and logistic regression. We're moving right along to other classification methods. And one of the classification methods that we're going to be talking about today is really, really important for our next stream on ensembling. And so um, make sure that you stick around and you pay extra close attention to our discussion of decision trees. Because when I come back from my, well, day off tomorrow, I'm going to be Skyping actually into some high school math classes um, and talking about machine learning and physics and astronomy. So it's going to take about six hours, so I figured I probably wouldn't have time to do all the prep I like to do for these streams, so we're not going to have any stream tomorrow, but I will be back whatever the day after tomorrow is. Thursday. Thursday. It's 23rd, right? 21st is today. That's Monday. Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, God. <laughs> this is what happens when I don't work. I forget what day of the week it is. Today is Monday. Yes? No, today's two, no, today's Monday. Oh my god. Yes, today is Monday. I will not be streaming tomorrow, Tuesday, but I will be coming back Wednesday to talk about random forests, which if you can kind of see a little bit of the uh, linguistic connection there, decision trees and random forests are indeed connected. So make sure you pay attention to those today. Um, nothing says holiday spirit quite like some anomaly detection. When am I doing anomaly detection? Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> I guess you could kind of work that into the holidays, right? Like, there was a star purportedly involved, wasn't there? So, and today's Monday. <laughs> yeah, I'm on top of my game here. No, stop trying to put it in the little cup holder. All right. Um, I know I miss my blue hair, but I have fire station training on the 5th, which as you can also see, is not a day that I will be streaming according to our schedule. And so, when my hair is this short, I can cover most of it with a cap, but even then, um, even though I'm not fully riding during COVID, they're still pretty strict about uniform requirements, so I can't have colorful hair. Um, so we'll see. In any case, let's, let's, let's dive right in here. So let me get our, that's not the right thing. Yes, let's get our, our blackboard all set up. Okie doke. Alrighty. So, okay. I gotta move everything. I feel like I need, <laughs> the more I stream, I need a bigger desk. <laughs> Which I don't think would help. I just have too many things I switch between. Um, so I have like my tablet for writing, my keyboard, the mouse. Thankfully it all fits on this like ginormous uh, mouse pad. But even then, I always feel like I need more room or like some kind of cool modular moving slots or something. All right, so let's talk classification. What even is classification? Does anyone remember this from yesterday? Please, soothe me. Let me know that something I said stuck with you. 
what do you remember from from classification yesterday? It doesn't have to be logistic regression, but like we talked about, you know, the day before we did regression, and then we talked about classification. So what what the hell even is classification? I love tea. Don't let me down, chat. Top secret information. Ha <laughs> ha, no, not quite. We're not talking about that. Determine the type of something. That's a great way to think about it. So instead of predicting a continuous value, we are going to be predicting membership in a class. And yes, MC Childs, of course, assigning things to a class. Um, and so we learned another kind of classification model yesterday, logistic regression. And thank you for following, Negla. And the thing that we really learned about that model, right, was that we could predict probabilities, we could control the threshold for membership to a class, but you know, the weights and the what we might say are the, the parameters of, of the model are a little bit harder to explain than a linear regression. Um, and physically twitching, absolutely, giving something a label. And that's a really great term because we're right now, as we actually, this is a great chance to review a little bit of what I talked about in day one, but now there are so many more of you. And so I wanna make sure nobody misses the good stuff, right? Which is if we have the wonderful world of machine learning, our, our favorite world. <laughs> this is, this is re relatively circular. <laughs> we have uh, supervised learning. Thank you, Manticora11, for following. That's that's our bubble here, maybe. Don't make it look like boobs, Jess. All right, um, we have unsupervised learning. <laughs> right, so we'll make that here. We have what we might call, actually, if, if these actually overlap, so let me do that a little bit better. Um, we might say if they overlap, we have semi-supervised learning, which we talked a little bit about yesterday as well. And we have uh, reinforcement learning. And then we have deep learning, but really deep learning can be kind of supervised, unsupervised. So, so it's more of an approach to a specific kind of, of neural net architecture that can be supervised or unsupervised. And so you might um, be asking, supervised, unsupervised, what does that mean? And this is, this is why visibly twitching was kind of perfect in what they said about giving something a label, which is our data has labels if we're doing supervised learning. If we're unsupervised, our data lacks labels. No labels for us. And so right now we're in the supervised learning worlds. We're talking supervised regression, supervised classification. And Onad, you say, this might sound dumb, but are some things unassignable? What do you mean by that? And there are no dumb questions, seriously. I promise you, like I have spent way too many years in classrooms thinking that I'm stupid for having questions. And really the worst mistake is just not asking the question. Um, and hi, third tier, welcome, welcome. Um, and where's the semi-reinforcement learning? Ha <laughs> ha. And hi, Anakin Luke. And there's different kinds of reinforcement learning. That's something that we'll cover later. I'm not gonna spoiler, you know, later streams also because, oh, I love reinforcement learning. This is, this is where my heart is. This is, reinforcement learning is where the cool, the coolness happens in my personal opinion. Nevertheless, we are in supervised learning. So we have been talking about I'm running out of colors, oh no. We've been talking about classification today. And we've also been talking about regression. When am I talking about reinforcement learning? Um, when am I talking about reinforcement learning chat? We just looked at the schedule. Let me, uh, looks like I'm introducing very basic reinforcement learning on the 30th and then we'll get into applying neural nets to reinforcement learning, which is really where reinforcement learning gets cool. Um, we'll talk Q networks and I wanna sneak, I wanna see if I can sneak in some actor critic stuff because that's really where reinforcement learning gets kind of neat in my opinion uh, on the 4th of January. 
um, assigning classifications. So, you, so what you're asking, Onad, is are there times where we're unable to assign a classification to something? Or are you asking, are there times where we lack a classification to compare to? And thank you, uh, Snake, Snake, P1 Scan and Razor Iso, Razor Siso, Razor Siso, yes, for following. Um, I know, Paranoid Polaroid, there's so 12 days, all right? It, there's a lot to cover. Um, there's a lot to cover in, in 12 days for sure. Whew, okay. Got to keep my voice this time. All right. So we are, we're here. So we're in supervised learning. We're still in the happy, wonderful. This is like when you're growing up and every Christmas is special. That is supervised learning because it, you have labels. The real world is kind of here where it's harsh and it's not friendly. And like your data probably very rarely has labels. And this is life is difficult in the unsupervised learning land. But right now we're going to stay in our happy childhood bliss of supervised learning. Um. Maybe I can make my own skill course for what? Um, and Sharknado mug. Actually, this is this was this is one of my favorite mugs. All right, and I love bringing this to the office pre-pandemic. I love this mug. <laughs> this embodies this embodies me at the office. <laughs> okay. Oh no. Where's my tablet? Here we go. All right. So. Putting shark, my, my beautiful great white shark, aside. It's like, this is just my personality in a cup, so. Anyway, this, this is the lay of the land, right? And really, what we're going to be talking to, about today is exactly what several people in chat answered beautifully, which is classification. We are trying to predict a particular feature vector's membership in a class, in a label. So what does that look like, right? So just a, I like to do just a brief review because obviously we're always getting new people um, in chat, but I don't want to take up too much of our time. So we talked about linear regression, right? So this is where we had all of our nice data points and we were trying to predict, I'll say this is linear, reg. Um, thank you for following Karova Milkman. So the important thing here to remember is we're trying to predict a continuous value. So that means things like temperature, weight, price, things that have a numerical value that is not a category. Creamy Zora, thank you for following. Um, the Great Courses, oh, that would be, that would be really, really cool. Um, okay, where, what was I talking about? Linear regression, predicted continue, right. And this is often used, like we talked about previously, forecasting slash predicting trends and talking remember we talked about feature importance and extracting our weights and so kind of feature feature importance is one way to think about that that's a that's a good term to learn um how much a given feature contributes to a particular outcome i know i love the galaxy and rainbow pens too I need, I need more pens. Like, I'm sad that this just gives me these because I want to be switching between a bunch of different colors. But at some point, I also want to make sure this is like, this probably isn't very colorblind accessible. So if anyone needs me to switch colors, please speak up, let me know. Okay. And then what we talked about yesterday with respect to classification was logistic regression, which a little bit of a misnomer. Thank you for following Deirja. Japonaganti. I'm sorry if I butchered that. I'm very bad with, with usernames. All right, so this is where we have membership in a class. This was a binary class membership, zero or one. We have our beautiful sigmoid function we talked about predicting a yes, no, 
did they die? Did they survive in the Titanic binary classification? And so we are here. We are predicting um, a label or class. Let me see. Is that over my head? Okay, you can still see that. <laughs> class membership. And we can also extract really easily, right? We can extract the probabilities of membership. Am I going to run into my head? I am. Here. No. Nope. There you go. <laughs> um, what is feature importance? Um, and greetings. Greetings from GR. Where is that? Gr Greece? I'm really bad with the, like, um, international codes, the international codes for countries, so... Athens, Greece. Oh my goodness. Welcome. Greek is one of the most beautiful languages that I have heard spoken. It is one of those things where when I was doing linguistics, I had to learn the alphabet. And of course, for math and physics, we learn the alphabet. I had to learn how to vaguely read it. Um, but it's not anywhere near just be able to hear people speak it so fluidly. What a beautiful language. So I'm a little bit jealous of you. <laughs> you you come from a country with an absolutely stunning language. So, um, let's see, what is feature importance? So on feature importance is, if you remember, we have our feature vector, right? And so that's all of our X's, right? So if we're thinking about our Y equals MX plus B in linear regression, we might have more features. So this X is actually kind of, not plus, sorry. This X is actually a lot more. It's all of those features put together. But not all of these features are equal. For example, with our Titanic data set that we talked about yesterday, someone's class of ticket might contribute a lot more to whether or not they survived than what port they embarked on. So that's feature importance. So which features are really important for making our predictions? Which ones are weighted pardon me, more heavily than others. Does that make sense? Seriously, if I'm like explaining it poorly, I'm, my head is probably 50% snot at this point. So <laughs> just tell me, be like, you're making no sense. Explain it better. Um, can, sorry, Suiko, I'm looking at your message now. Um, can you have something that can be grouped into categories and have a numerical relationship between the groups as well? Numerical relationship between the groups as well? Yes. So if I'm understanding you correctly, what that could be is something like age groups, for example. So this is something that came really, really important. If I can have a small tangent for a second to answer this question and also to have a little data science aside with you all about one of the kind of real life challenges about doing some, some data science modeling. Um, oh my goodness, ASDF Wendy, thank you for following, is one of the difficulties in doing COVID predictions, for example is that different hospitals, different universities and groups actually um, divide up their patient data into different age groups. And so you might have, um, thank you Drone PT for following, you might have one group that has Why is this what time? May 26. Maybe this is one. I seriously saw data that was 0 to 18, 19 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, and 60 plus. Like even just looking at these, right? We have different groups here. We have different, you know, we could call these categories, but there's a numerical relationship between these various categories. Not only that, but, you know, one of the things as we're talking through all of these different kinds of machine learning that I've been trying to kind of impart on you is not just, oh, I know how to use this scikit-learn library and, oh, I know what a linear regression function looks like, but also how to start to think critically about your data. And this is a lot of the EDA streams that I've done previously. But also, we got to start, we got to start thinking a little bit more analytically, right? And so when you see this, what are some problems that jump out? Let's say I have two data sets I want to combine to predict, you know, COVID fatalities across age groups. And these are the two data sets I have. What jumps out to you? Like, what do you think some of the problems are here? Let's 
I love T. <sighs> and where would you place GAs and PSOs on this field? Help me out with the acronyms. I'm literally the worst person. I actually try to avoid acronyms as much as possible because I don't know what it is about my brain. My job, I literally, for every single contract I'm on, have to make massive, massive, massive lists of, of, of um, acronyms because I'm very bad at them. So thank you, PK Patricia, for following. We aren't comparing to apples to apples. Add them together so you have a convoluted mess. Misalignment of categories. What do you mean by that? And there, there isn't just one answer here. There's, there's a lot of problems that, that go into this, unfortunately. Um, Pudstein and Kim Tech, thank you for following. Genetic algos and particle swarm optimization. I haven't done much with particle swarms, I'll be honest. Genetic algorithms is more a, I would say, field of application. So I've seen a variety of different kinds of genetic algorithms um, that range from more kind of like network and graph analytics, even to stuff that looks even like re reinforcement learning. So it'd be like saying, where does computer vision fit in there? Well, we have to be careful about distinguishing between classes of models and then fields of application, if that makes sense. Um, Disparity in upper limits. Yes, that's a big part. The age groups here are not aligned and so they can't easily be compared. Exactly. Exactly. Hi, Blowfish. Welcome, welcome. Friends of impressive words for simple things. Ugh. welcome to my world. If we could, I feel like sometimes that, I mean, we've all been there, right? Where we're talking about something we're really passionate about and maybe you like the person, maybe you want them to think that you're cool. And so it makes sense. You wanna use the fancy words, right? But when you're, commu when you're a communicator, especially a science communicator, it's really about using the terms that are the simplest. And one thing, I, you know, one obstacle I've run into on Twitch is that when I'm doing kind of teaching streams, I've gotten some pushback from people being like, well, <laughs> what you're talking about is this fancy word. I'm like, I know it's that fancy word. I'm not gonna use that fancy word because nobody, it's not gonna reach the most amount of people. And that fancy word is just an academic term for, for something that is a lot simpler to explain. And that, it, it, it bothers me. Also, you know, being self-taught programmer, it means that there are a lot of fancy, fancy terms for different kinds of algorithms and software architectures that I've built. I know them. Do I know the fancy academic term? Not always, but that doesn't mean I don't know what I'm doing. So, it's a little bit of my soapbox, I guess. Oh no, does that mean Oh, I have to, I did. I went on a soapbox, didn't I? Fine. That's not bad. It's only been eight times since I added that to stream. Okay. So, nevertheless, yes, chat. You wonderful people have pointed out a lot of issues with these age groupings. There's a couple other things I'd want to point out. Namely, if I got data that was like, you know, we had a 0.0, .0 I don't I don't even remember the numbers. 2% fatality in this group, 0.03% in this group. This one was 0.04. Like this is going to be really hard to compare. Not only that, but even across data sets, the age spans that each of these are following are non-uniform. This one is like each of these are nine years, right? But here, this one's nine years. This is six years. This is eight years. Here we have nine years, nine years. 60 to 80, this is like 20 plus years. Um, this is 18 years. And suddenly you've, you've, gotten, you've gotten into this trap because your data isn't uniform. Instead of being able to have access to the raw data of each individual patient, you have these groups that are really hard to compare across. And so that was to answer a question about not just categorical variables that might have mathematical or, or numerical relationships to each other, but also a problem that we can run into when binning our data. Be very wise and be very cautious when you bin your data um, because you can, you can run into a lot of problems there. Okay, so let's return, my dear friends, to classification because I have, I have two models to show you today instead of just one. So I've got a bit of stuff to get through. Hubble, his status is always a very good boy. Okay. So we're going to learn two different models today. And our first one 
is called so put one K nearest neighbors. All right, and so um, you've been missed last two days, I've been catching up with the Twitch VODs. Okay, yes, I'm so glad you could make it tonight. I do need to download these, put them on YouTube. Um, I, I guess I need to make a YouTube channel, that's good to know. Um, I think I have one just associated with my Gmail account, but um, I, will, I will do my best to put the videos on YouTube. Also, please be aware that the code that we go through every night is available on GitHub. Pardon me. And um, what was the other thing? I will be releasing more annotated notes that include math and visualizations and whatnot. That will be available on GitHub probably following the whole series. So I'm really, right now, I'm just focused on getting you the code that we work through every day. But I have really messy notes um, that I that I kind of do these streams off of, and I'm gonna clean those up, add some additional context for you, links, resources, etc. And then those will be available on uh, GitHub probably after these streams end. So um, standards and conventions are sometimes important so that the way people, exactly Suiko, so Suiko, you are, you are touching on a very important point, which as much as I <laughs> sometimes loathe that I, I come into projects, you know, raring to build really cool machine learning models and my, uh, my work becomes a lot more about data standards. Those projects are a little bit annoying. It is very important because standardization, regularization of your data is very crucial. Um, it, it adds a lot of work and often can prevent accurate results if everyone's using different conventions. So, absolutely. All right, so one of the things that is really, really cool about K nearest neighbors. We're gonna learn some terms, all right? But they're they're gonna sound fancy and they're very simple. This is our first non-parametric model that we're learning. Okay. What the hell does that even mean? Maybe I think the rainbow pen might be a bit obnoxious. Um, but I'm gonna use it anyway. So this means that we we don't really have an equation with parameters. Um, it's not like our linear regression where we have those weights, our y equals mx plus b, where we can just yoink that m right out and see kind of the weight of x. Um, but more importantly, and this is the advantage, we're not making any assumptions. Okay, that's no ass. All right, that's, that's not fun to look at. I'm sorry, hold on. I will use green because it's holiday themed. No assumptions about the distribution, yes, and that's under the thing, so. The distribution of our data. So what does that mean? That's a lot of fancy words. Let's break it down so everyone follows. And thank you for following, speaking of which, uh, peplosum. So, distribution of our data. Do you remember how when we were talking about uh, linear regression, I mentioned that linear regression, one of the problems, it makes an assumption. It makes an assumption that our data has a linear relationship between our feature vector and our labels. This makes no assumptions about the distribution of our data. It doesn't make any assumption about the shape of our feature vector, about its relationship to the labels, nothing. Which makes it a lot easier to apply when we're in that kind of, you know, fog of war situation where we, we don't know the lay of the land, we've just been given some data and we're like, I don't know what this shows. We can throw a K nearest neighbors at it and at least get some preliminary results. Um, thank you, Mustafa Hayati, for uh, following and also Dgrinder HC. Um, the way organizations report their data can be subject to political motivations. Absolutely, Jay Hund, you're absolutely right. A mediocre gamer has a wonderful shout out for a brilliant game which is that if anyone is interested in playing Stardew Valley, it is 33% off right now on Steam. Also, the uh, latest uh, patch was just released. It's huge. It's only out for Steam, I believe. So sad panda for those of us who play it on Switch. I will be anxiously awaiting that update for Switch. Um, but it is a huge, huge update, honestly. Um, adds a whole bunch of like a new, a new person, new quests. If you are stressed by the pandemic or just life in general, it is a very soothing game, I recommend it. Anyway, 
So not making assumptions about the distribution of our data is a massive, massive, massive advantage because most real life data doesn't follow perfect distributions, okay? It really doesn't. And so our non-parametric models are a little bit, sometimes they're gonna perform a little bit better. Um, and they're also just out of the box, they're gonna do a little bit better because if we have a data set that's maybe messier, that's more, you know, real life, um, the non-parametric non models are going to succeed a bit more. Um, what is non-parametric, like a noun of something or a verb about behavior? So parametric is an adjective, right? Ooh, bringing out my linguistic hat here. So this is an adjective. Adjective form of parameter, which is really just think about the... The M from before. This is one of our... This is a model parameter. And so, like I said, we're not going to be... Our, our equations for k-nearest neighbors, we are not going to have parameters. It is non-parametric. Um, thank you, C-sharp Fritz, for following. Are you, are you a fan of the C-sharp language? I am learning it myself, and I, I love it. K-onad, we're going to get to. But just as good Joe is right. It's going to be the number of neighbors we choose, but we haven't quite got there. So we're going to... Um, we're gonna go into that shortly. Okay, there's one more term that I want you to learn. This one's kind of fun a little bit, is that k-nearest neighbors is a lazy algorithm. It's lazy. I love that so much, I don't know why. Um, oh no, Edwin, you dropped your machine learning class once you got to this, once you got to what? Well, stick with me. Nobody drops my classes. That sounds really braggy, but like, I can't tell you how much of my personal time I have spent helping students just make sure that they can keep going. So like, seriously, Y equals MX plus B? Oh no, don't, don't flee, all right? Make sure that you watch the linear regression video from two days ago. We cover Y equals MX plus B in detail. There is nothing to be afraid of, I promise. But also um, hit me up on Discord if, if you're stuck and you wanna talk more. Uh, Brandy Sensei, thank you, thank you for following. Um, they will be uploaded on YouTube. I haven't gotten around to it yet. I've never done that before. Um, but the, the Twitch VODs are available for now. Um, and yes, I have, uh, Christmas decorations instead of earrings. <laughs> gotta get, gotta get in the, gotta get in the spirit. Okay. Lazy algorithms. What does this actually mean? It doesn't mean that it's lazy. It doesn't mean that it's bad. All right. A lazy algorithm. All that means is that we don't really have a training phase explicitly. So before we were doing our test like test train split or train test split, I always split the switch the two. We'll still have that kind of split, but there isn't quite the explicit training phase that we had before. So what this means, unfortunately, is that so there isn't an explicit training phase and it isn't remember so so we're running into this problem because we have a combination of non-parametric we're not making assumptions we don't have this y equals mx plus b business and we're lazy so there's one kind of there's one kind of drawback here right which is that because there is an explicit training phase we have to hold all of the training data in memory. So what that means is that k-nearest neighbors can slow way down if our data sets get large. We have a computational inefficiency here. We run into memory problems and speed problems if our data set gets very, very, very large. Put a pin in this though. Don't, don't rule KNN out just yet because when we talk about anomaly detection, I'm gonna show you some ways to take this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful algorithm and speed it the hell up. So we're gonna talk about the sort of out of the box KNN today, but there are ways to make it a lot better. There's gonna, there's gonna be ways that we can avoid this issue or at least make it better. But so the other thing is that when, when we're talking about machine learning, we're really interested in how well we can get 
our model to generalize. And what does that mean, right? That's kind of the opposite. Let's actually clear some room here for ourselves in our blackboard, whiteboard thing. Okay, so what does it mean? Why, why all of this hullabaloo about generalization? It's kind of like the holy grail in a lot of ways, especially for language models. But because if, if we were to put like a scale of bad to good, overfitting would be on one side, generalization would be the other. So overfitting is like something that is tailor fit to one very, very, very specific instance. It performs amazing so long as that data is from this one very specific instance. Generalization is where we've been able to abstract relationships and trends so that we can make predictions about data that we haven't seen before. So ideally when we're on this scale, what we want, we, we, we really want this. This is great. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna draw a broken heart very well. This is not so great. We don't want overfitting because we're not able to take that model and apply it to new situations. So when we are looking at models, the ability of a model to generalize is something that we should always be thinking about in the back of our heads. Um, Stoic Leaf, you say, the name's Carolyn Ostley on the, Bob, of course, Big Orange Book. It's the Bible of astrophysics. I have a copy somewhere. Bob, good old Bob. I love Carolyn Ostley. Like, there, there's a lot of, uh, I saw this um, actually, I don't know if you're on Twitter, but I saw this amazing D&D &D alignment chart for like intro astrophysics textbooks and it was so good. And, um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name. How can I forget the name? My quantum mechanics textbook was like neutral good or like it was, no, it was lawful, lawful neutral, I think. Anyway, um, oh, what was that? This is why I shouldn't open my mouth before I think. I'm completely blanking on the author, but I, I uh, Griffiths, Griffiths. All of his stuff was like good in some way, of course. Um, but Bob, Bob is a, Bob is a staple of any early graduate, late undergraduate astrophysics education. Um, hi, Anacodes, welcome. Okay. If you run KNN multiple times, will every simulation end in the same classification? So it's not quite a simulation. So I'll stop you there. Um, if you run it multiple times, oh, there's a lot of there's a lot of details missing there. I would say it really depends. It depends on a lot of things. Um, s some of what it depends on is like what we talked about previously with data shuffling. Um, it also depends on the number of nearest neighbors you've picked. And it depends, like, you know, if I were to, that's that's why when we're fitting our KNN, you'll see later, we use a random seed because there is a little bit of variation. Um, Tag Bon, thank you for following. Quantum McGinn McIntyre, thankfully I've never touched that. Um, okay, so, but really this generalization is what we're aiming to achieve. Can we extract these sort of general principles from a problem so that our model can learn them and apply them to new situations. Because if you think about, think about driving, right? I answered that loaf bone. You don't need to highlight it. I totally, totally answered it. I just went on a rant about the amazingness that is Carolyn Osley. Bob, big orange book. We affectionately in graduate school called it Bob. Carolyn Osley is wonderful. It's okay, Loaf Bone, you just have to pay attention better. Um, I'm joking, of course. Loaf Bone is our wonderful stalwart singular mod, so <laughs> cut him some slack. PK Patricia, thank you for subscribing. Thank you so much, and and, and thank you for supporting the channel. Um, I think sometimes people uh, don't quite know how much work it takes putting in um, all of the work into these streams. Like it, I try to keep it casual, but I try to do a lot of research. And, and when I'm building the code, I think a lot about what's gonna work for everyone and good data sets to use and making sure everything works. So, um, I got on my soapbox again. <laughs> Crap, I like my soapbox. Thank you, IC Yogi and QM Ruffall for following. Nine times in 45 minutes. No, 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 that's my total. That's my global count. That's not my local count. Okay, so hopefully all of you understand now why generalization is so important. 
think, for example, of when on day one, we were talking about the difference between AI and machine learning, right? And I kind of explained it like this, is we can have the bubble that is AI, right? And machine learning, machine learning is a part of that, but there can be AI that is not machine learning. And oopsies, wrong color, hold please. This stuff, right, is what we were talking about, about a rules-based AI. That's that giant book I told you of if-then conditionals, that if we were to write a program to just iterate through a whole bunch of if statements and follow the if-then sequence, we could approximate something that would seem like human intelligence. But is it learning? It's not learning. The secret here, the, the, the secret sauce with machine learning is generalization. The ability to extract from complex situations general rules to follow to arrive at conclusions. Why are we talking about up? I cry during up. I don't cry during many things, but the first the first two minutes, and then I'm like, yeah, I'm good for the rest of it. But oh, the first time I saw it, now I'm, I'm good. But weird things make, Moana makes me cry every single time I see it, which I honestly don't cry about that many things. You can ask Loaf Bone, like, I will watch plenty of things that are very sad, but Moana makes me cry because the grandma dies and it makes me think about my grandma. So, you know what? I think sometimes, like, I, I used to cry less before bad things happened in my life. And then the more bad things happened in my life, the more that things would make me cry. So it's a weird, it's a weird trade-off. Anyway, rules-based, <laughs> rules-based AI. No, screw you, antivirus. Um, Fern Gully, I loved Fern Gully. Okay, I'm good, I'm focused. Enough with the, where's the bare minimum? What is the bare minimum for something to be considered AI? You know, Jahan, that's a, um, that's more complicated complicated question than you think actually and thank you for following pork chop sees you welcome so it, it's a more complicated question because ai loosely is defined as a machine completing tasks that we would normally say would require human intelligence so it's it's a very loose definition but um, being able to generate human language, being able to identify things in an image, these are often things that we associate with artificial intelligence. Hi, Spawn! I haven't seen you around in a while. Welcome. But one of the keys, really, is that a rules-based AI is going to be incredibly, incredibly inflexible. If a rules-based AI is confronted with a situation or with data that it's never seen before, it will fail. However, if we're able to perfect generalization, the ability of a model to extract those abstract principles and apply them to new situations, we'll be able to create algorithms that can see new data, new situations, and won't fail. So this is, this is a really, really important balance here. And also this is, this is what we're looking for. Um, and so the reason why I wanted to bring up generalization is that laziness of the k-nearest neighbors algorithm that we were talking about is that without that training phase when we have to hold all that training data in memory we're not generalizing like don't get me wrong KNN is wonderful so don't just drop it in the trash because i've told you it's not really generalizing but when our data set gets very very large we're going to struggle because the model can't effectively generalize, generalize um, the relationships between the data points. But also, like I said, I'm going to show you some cool ways to make it better. So don't don't throw the algorithm out with the, the baby algorithm out with the algorithm bathwater, whatever. <laughs> um, OK, and also don't confuse KNN with K-means. We'll do that another day. So let's, let's, let's consider an example here. What are some things I can classify? So let's say, hmm. I literally wrote in the notes, come up with an example, draw an example. Cause I was like, you'll be fine. You'll come up with something that I'm sitting here and I'm like, uh, I have a cold. I don't know what is classification. So I'm gonna draw these beautiful axes and give myself some time. So somebody, somebody tell me something they want to classify, actually. I'll leave it up to you, chat. Um, OK. 
Okay, we're talking about movies. Thoughts on the book Computer Science Distilled. Pastel Condor. I haven't read it, actually. Um, so, so maybe we want to talk about TV shows. Genres. That's a perfect, that's a perfect example. Okay. So what this might look like. No, I don't want this. All right, let's do this. Is we're going to have. No, why? I thought this would be a, isn't this a highlighter? There we go. Um, all right, do, 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 pardon the terrible drawing. I'm not an artist, do, 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 do. but this is important. So the ugly drawings are going to be important for some things that we're going to do later. And later we'll just make our, our wonderful Python libraries do the ugly drawings for us. It'll be great. Just listen to the nice music while I'm coloring. Accent eight. Thank you for following. Oh no, 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 no. To like be weird looking. And thank you, Gussie, for following. Welcome, new friends, to the stream. This is the mellow part where I am apparent. <laughs> Didn't expect this to be so involved, but you know. Um. I guess we'll do. What other colors do I have? Purple. All right, we'll do this light purple. This is like some jazzy, jazzy Christmas carols. Groovy. All right. So, you're probably like, what, what the actual hell is going on? She's drawing horrible things. Bear with me. Oh, if I press harder, oh, that's cool. Sorry, this tablet's new, so. But maybe we made some mistakes. So we'll, we'll spread our data out a little bit. Our model's not perfect. No one is, don't be judging. So this, Nito, hold on, hold on. More tea is being made and then I will hydrate my friend. So please, please hold your, hold your, hold your redeem there. I've seen your space bowling game. I'm not an artist, that game is hot trash. I love it so much. I love, I love my terrible uh, space bowling game, but alas. And Mediocre Gamer, those are both excellent, excellent TV shows. Um. And Pasto Condor, what is your first step to becoming an IT wizard? I'm not an IT wizard. That sounds like a loaf bone question. Um, so <laughs> that classification has its roots in classification of books. Yes. We all secretly desire to be librarians. Um, oh no, I missed you. No, I didn't. I didn't miss you. I just got, got to your question. I had to scroll up a little bit. Um, and answered your question about, about books. All right, so. Let's say that we've got some we've got some classifications here, and I think I decided we were talking about movie genres, right? So let's say this is action, action movies. That's one of our classes. Green is my favorite color, and my favorite is science fiction. And blue will be I don't know, like romance or something. I don't like whatever. Romance is for losers. Okay, so. Loafbone's making tea, so give Loafbone a second. So what we have here is kind of a model of what we're trying to do. We have, now we're, we're, we're doing some oversimplification here, so don't, before, you know, the well actually people come into chat, I know we're taking a multi-dimensional feature vector, we're representing it in one dimension, deep breaths, it's okay, it's all right. But this is a really useful way to visualize what our K nearest neighbors algorithm is going to be doing because we're grouping similar data points together. And we, what would brave little toaster fall into? Brave little toasters art, brave little toasters too great for this diagram. Um, <laughs> um, but what, what we're trying to get at here is something called decision boundaries, right? So here, we've drawn the lines between genres that would help us make a decision 
about which movie is which category, we've kind of drawn them like this. We have unsub why? Um, Mr. Claude K K N N. I'm sorry, is K nearest neighbors, and that is the that is the model that is the algorithm that we're talking about today. Um, thank you for following. Oh no, were you saying pastel condor? I missed your follow. I'm so sorry if I did. Um, and E S E Ish. I'm not gonna try to say that. Something code. Thank you so much for following. <laughs> um, but. This is what we're trying to generalize. This is what we're trying to abstract is these boundaries between classes, between groups of data. And Mr. Claude, this is actually this is going to be this is going to be a type of supervised learning today. We will cover clustering, which is a little bit similar. We're going to cover that in our uh, Eshka means love so much. Ooh, in what language? Um, we're going to be covering that in our unsupervised learning section of the streams. So if this is if this is our motto and we're trying to Persian or Farsi, where's MC Childs? <laughs> I, I think I, I think I can hear him swooning from here. <laughs> I so my focus in, in college was actually Arabic, North African uh, dialects of Arabic. But if I remember right, uh, MC Childs, I don't know if you're cool with me actually just saying your first name, but um, you did a lot of Farsi, didn't you? If I remember right. And MacGyver, I know they're actually Christmas ornaments. I had to be, I had to be in, you know, in the Christmas spirit or holiday spirit. Okay. So each of these lines that I've drawn between classes, these class boundaries, these are what we call decision boundaries. And that's really what we're going to be about today when we're talking about K nearest neighbors. We are interested, where are these decision boundaries? Where are the lines that we can draw in this plane that will separate our various classes. And that's what our beautiful K nearest neighbors algorithm is going to try to do. Not only that, but there's a fancy term. So those of you who are doing tech interviews, data science interviews, here's the fancy unnecessary term for this kind of plot. And I can't spell because I'm thinking about other things. A Voronoi diagram. That's what this is. Um, so this we would say is um, how to explain this. Um, give me one second. I'm trying to make sure I'm not too off base in my notes here. I kind of almost talked about that, sort of. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so this is this is kind of like our decision space, right? This whole space is where we need to make a decision about which class, which label, these various movies that we have here. So I don't know, maybe this one is The Notebook. I think that's a romance movie, right? That's the one with like rain or something. Science fiction, this is like Aliens. Uh, maybe this is Stargate, we'll, we'll include TV shows. This is Farscape. We'll just include, I could do this all day, action movies. I don't know, Die Hard, Taken, whatever. We've got action movies and science fiction movies, romance movies, right? So this is our decision space where we have to make a decision about what class these various data points um, contact. Yes, let's add contact. There's a bit of romance, so it can be closer to the romance uh, boundary. Um. These also come up in solid state physics. Very, very cool. Um, these are ornaments, they're not disco balls. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to embody my, you know, holiday spirit. Uh, LK Rayner, thank you for following. And so these things right here are our decision boundaries. And so that's really what we're gonna be interested in predicting, like I've mentioned. And so how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna get from, you know, a giant database of movies with lengths and actor names and, and other things all the way into this wonderful kind of diagram with our decision boundaries labeled. Well, my friends, the way that we're going to do that is through our K nearest neighbors. Yes. Let's use, let's use our excellent. I love this pen so much. <laughs> all right. So how do 
we do Kane nearest neighbors? Let's talk about let's talk about it without code first, and then we'll move into code. Okay. Um, we're not gonna argue about movie things. I people can argue about Die Hard all they want. <laughs> I should not have used Die Hard. I was just arguing with someone about Die Hard, and so that's why. Ooh, my tea is hot. That's wonderful. Okay. Oh, I need to put scotch in that eventually. All right, so. Right. Step one. Uh, thank you, IHVH1969. Thank you for following. How do you handle multiple classifications? Some movies can be science fiction and action, for example. That's a really, really interesting question. Um, and so the, you got an ad blocker warning. I try to not like run ads on my stream, but Twitch kind of does it for me sometimes, whether or not I like it. So Jayhend, there's a couple of things. You can have class overlap, absolutely. What I've seen some people handling specifically genre classes with is they have a dominant, well, this is gonna sound, <laughs> don't take this the wrong way, but there's gonna be a dominant class and like a, there's gonna be a parent class and a child class. Let's let's go with there. I was gonna go dom and sub, but that's making this a little bit too, you know after hours but um apple pie alibi thank you for following so a lot of times it will be a nested classification that is predicting the parent and then the child class based on relationships like that um so it almost be like two classification algorithms running side by side um but it is a very interesting question because i think this is something onad was kind of getting at at the beginning of the stream right is well <laughs> What do you do when when the decision boundaries aren't so clear, when things are a little bit murkier, like in real life? And that's that's a very, very valid question. Fifty Shades of Classification, no! <laughs> Give me the ad rep, right? I'll have you know, all of all of my wonderful humans in chat, that I am on I'm on I'm technically on vacation right now. And I've been spending each of my days of vacation sitting at my computer writing code and lecture notes for you so you should this this should this is how much i love you all all right so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick pick a value for k what does that mean right what is what is k how many that's not how you spell many how many nearby Data points, is this gonna run into the thing now? Nata data points, do we look at to determine our label? Oh, Nad, are you, are you, are you asking for the snoots? Is that what you're doing? Are you, are you asking to, to give the dogs a treat? Let me finish this real quick and then we will. So one of the cool things in my stream is that if you donate a hundred bits, if you give us some cheers, you get to give my dogs treats via our, our treat camera. So give me one sec to get through this and then absolutely we will. How many data points though? Well, that's that's the point. That's our value for K. That's that's the critical question. And Derp and Stiltskin, welcome. Thank you for following. And Icy Yogi, thank you so much. Um, yeah, you know, I don't have to work during the day, so I don't mind. Um, I do really love talking about machine learning, but there are going to be, as you notice in the stream schedule, there's going to be some gaps because I need to also put my feet up and play some goddamn video games. Um, so that's going to happen too. Thank you for following Cyberfart and Acromonic. Um, okay. So then we're going to search for K data points, right? And we're gonna see um, the K nearest, and we'll talk about what that means. So, so don't worry too much about it. We'll, we'll math it out, right? Once we have those K nearest data points, we look at the average, the median, sometimes even the mode. So we'll just say the most popular, based on whatever statistical measure we use, most popular label amongst those data points and that that is our that is what our model returns <laughs> no games only code <laughs> jayhand no we all we, we don't want to burn out okay all right so let me see 
Let me grab the Furbo really quick and let's see, let's see if... Give me one sec to load it up. See if the dogs are nearby and we'll give them a treat. They're very good boys and they always deserve treats from stream. Okay. And in this, in this channel, we do code our own games. Well, I try to, and the games, I, I try. We'll see. <laughs> it's mixed effectiveness sometimes, but I am learning. Okay. All right, my friends. So here's the Furbo, and let's see. Let's, let's, let's throw some treats out. It'll make a noise. Let's see if we can get the pups over for Onad. Thank you so much for the bits, Onad. You are wonderful. Let's see if the dogs uh, will humor us with their presence. Oh yeah, he's over real fast. Do you like that collar? That's his light up collar. Isn't he a good boy? Hubble, I love you. You're such a good boy, have some treats. So this is Hubble, named for the Space Telescope. He is my beautiful, wonderful dog. He is also the source of several emotes in chat. Um, he's, a very, he's very awake today. Yeah, so that, if that collar's on, that means he was just outside. Um, if we try, so, so, I have, a, I have a little bit of a sad story for you all. Since the pandemic, both uh, Hubble and Tennessee, the singing dog. So if you'd like to see, this is, this is usually how we end stream, by the way. Tennessee sings. Um, okay, you're such a good boy. You can have another one. I don't care. Have, it, have another treat. Um, since pandemic, they've, they've, they've been able to go out a lot more because, you know, not at work all day. And... Uh, what that has led to, unfortunately, has been Tennessee, not this dog, not the big one, right? Hubble is like 70 plus pounds. Tennessee's like 30. Tennessee spends all day sleeping. Oh, you want another one? You can have another one because you're a good boy. Okay. Oh, yes. You don't have to boop it with your nose. I love you. Um, Hubble is the one that looks like a hunter, right? He's big. He's like, he'll growl and you're like, wow, okay. Like that's, you're, you're, you're a big dog. Tennessee spends all day sleeping, doesn't seem to raise a paw to do anything. Tennessee is the silent killer. So since the pandemic has started, Tennessee has murdered five possums, four and a half possums, and a squirrel. And the squirrel, oh, don't sit. I have to reward you if you sit. He does this, he knows he's a good boy. Oh, don't, don't do that look. I'm such a sucker. Oh my God. Um, Tennessee, I was sitting on the couch, just trying to wake up before a morning meeting. And Tennessee runs by me with what I thought was, you know, a toy. I was like, yeah, that's fine. Jumps up on the couch next to me. I'm like, oh, he's got his toy. That's such a good boy. I'm like sitting there, la 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 la, like typey typey on my work laptop, trying to wake up, you know, work slack, whatever. Um, get log, what did my <laughs> teammates break while I was sleeping? Okay, no, no, stop licking, I can't. You're such a good boy. All right, no, we're, we're, we're moving this away or I'll keep treating him and he'll be gigantic. Um, and I looked over at Tennessee, just casually, cause he's a good boy, I wanted to pet him. I reached over, my hand was like stretching across the distance to pet my dog. And I realized that what he had in his mouth was not a toy, but a dead squirrel. And he was looking at me like, I'm so good, I'm so happy. And he's sitting there on my couch with a dead squirrel. So, opossums, Dunstable Ramsey. Uh, they are cute, rodent-like tree-dwelling mammals. They're adorable. Do you know how many bodies like we've had to clean up? I had to take the half-dead body of an opossum baby and put it in a freaking trash bag because of Tennessee. It was, so we have added light up collars, motion sensor lights to the backyard, everything that we can try to make sure that they stop murdering local wildlife. Oh, Hubble, Hubble only, Hubble has killed two, two birds since the, um, the, the pandemic has started, but he's, he's usually not as much a murderer. I think he tries to play with them and he's just so big that, um, yeah. Tennessee has murdered rabbits. Like he will grab them, he will shake, break their neck and gets like, yeah, he's, he's, he's the hunter. Um, possums are great. Yeah, exactly. Loaf bone. They, they, they eat thousands of ticks every day. They're good. They're good. Um, they're good animals, but Tennessee also seems to like to eat them. Okay. So 
as before we move on to the code, there's one there's one thing to to clean up here. Um, at least we won't starve if anything. I'm not eating a possum, not unless it's like the zombie apocalypse and I have to. Um, which is clear canvas, please. Which is which is what does nearest even mean? What what? Oh no, our, our wonderful Christmas music stopped. Please hold friends. It must mean I've been streaming for an hour. Replay, hell yeah. Let's keep that, keep that holiday cheer going. What does nearest mean? Closest, yes, Professor Bob, but what does closest mean in this sense? Shortest distance. Here's where, here's where shit gets complicated, my friends. And this, there, there are, there are, so many different ways. We we could go down some some complicated rabbit holes and trust me if you want to get into cosmology, this gets even more complicated. Because we would say often, right? The the shortest distance between two points in two-dimensional space is a line. But once we talk three dimensions, things get a little bit more complicated and once we're dealing with a, you know, 3000 dimension feature vector saying what is the most accurate representation of distance suddenly gets really murky and really complicated. So I'm not going to go through all of the distant, all of the different distance metrics, but I'm going to talk about the one that we're going to be using today, which is the Euclidean distance. Sounds fancy. You all already know it. This is again, fancy word for something very, very, very simple. No, we're not using Manhattan distance. Um, but other ones you might talk about like Minkowski, Manhattan, there's a bunch of different ways to define distance and distance metrics, but we are going to, um, we're gonna, we're gonna be real simple today. So, Ameranda, thank you for following. I know we're going, we're going back to ye old X, Y plane here. So let's say that we have um, two points. We're gonna have one at the origin, and we're gonna have one that is at, um, oh no, that's, I need a different color. No, no, this is zero, zero. We're gonna have one that's at one, one. What's the distance? Oh my god, that is not <laughs> the line that links these two. What what's the what's the distance here? Well, those of you who have survived some high school math will likely notice that we have a triangle here. Cuz that's a triangle, Jess. We have not just any triangle. My my dears, we have we have a right triangle. So yes, this wonderful little square. And what we're asking, what is the hypotenuse? So that should that should start to trigger maybe some panic thoughts from high school math. Um, but what we're gonna actually have is the square root of which is the square root of two. Yes, good job, good job, Dia. To kiss and also onad pythagoras precisely it's also called the euclidean distance the if we are to generalize this because we we like our machine learning models want to be able to generalize and we have a distance between two points the distance between them right, is this. And the beautiful thing about this is that the, it doesn't matter how many dimensions we go, we're just going to keep adding plus c squared, plus d squared, plus q squared, whatever the hell you want. So we are able to extrapolate this to many dimensions very, very, very easily. So if this were in three dimensions, we'd have a plus c squared, this would be d. And Euclidean distance, I feel like is, is a very kind of in intuitive understanding of the distance between two things. It is not always the most accurate, though, 
Um, Mr. Claude, you say, I have a question though. If the features are categorical, how can Euclidean distance make sense? It's a really good question. So let's go back to our, the diagram that we were talking about earlier. So I'm gonna do this fast. So pardon me if the drawing is gonna be, if the drawing quality has suddenly gone down. But I do wanna get onto the code and we also have a whole other model type to talk about today. So, blue, yeah. So if these are our groups and our data is something like that. I know it's messy. We're gonna make it messy just for this. Bear with me. All right, this is our very, very half-assed Voronoi diagram. Let's say we have a new, a, like a new contender, a new Pokemon has appeared, all right? And so this, this, this new, this new data point is here, okay? So we need to then get the K nearest neighbors. Let's say our nearest neighbors five is often used. Let's use our five nearest neighbors. So here, 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 that's four, five. Let's just say that's our five, okay? So we grab each of these data points. We're using here the Euclidean distance. We measure the distance of this point to about every other point. We find, the, we find the five nearest ones. We go, what's their label? And in this, the label is green. And let's actually, you know what? Let's make this six, <laughs> six so that I can grab, like, let's say this one. We've got five green and one purple. And regardless of whether we're using the mode, median, or mean here, the answer that our model is going to return is a predicted green label for this new data point. Um, thank you, uh, Romskian, for following. Is there a way to systematically choose what K is? Yes, there is. Um, and we will be getting into that. So hold that question. Um, and commentator. This is the rise of the machines. No, we're not building Skynet, I promise. We're nowhere near there. We struggle to get machines to understand the difference between a dog and a cat. So we are nowhere near, uh, we're nowhere near Skynet. So, so the one with the lowest number by adding the distances of all five neighbors finds the most popular dot. It's more that we, we have a new, a new data point, let's say X, right? And we search the distances between X and all the other data points. And then we find the five lowest distances, so the five nearest neighbors, we look, what are their labels? And depending on how we've defined our model and designed it, we might choose the mean, median, mode, whatever. We're gonna say, what is the most common, depending or average, uh, label amongst the nearest neighbors, and that is the label that we are going to predict for our new data point. So that is the basics of, of the model that we're going to be building today. Um, so there are a lot of applications I've seen this done to predict political affiliations, credit ratings, um, all kinds of things. It does require its neighbors to already have a label, yes, j -Hand, and that is what makes this a supervised learning method because the data that we are training on, remember, it's non-parametric, we don't really have a training phase, um, but the data that we're using to make predictions has to have a label. And so that's what makes it a supervised learning model. So. If you have highly dimensional data, a lot of times you're gonna combine this with a dimensional, dimensionality reduction uh, method. We'll be going into those later in the 12 days of machine learning. Um, thank you, HOI288 for following. Um, and this is because KNN in particular is, is really subject to, is, is subject to what we would call the curse of dimensionality means that extra dimensions, especially dimensions that are irrelevant or extraneous, can really complicate this model. Yes, like like principal component analysis. Yes, just as good, Joe. That's a very common combination with KNN. Um, 
Nevertheless, k is absolutely great because it is non-parametric. We're not making assumptions about any kind of relationship in our data. It's simple, it's easy to understand, it's very explainable, which makes it a great kind of out of box algorithm to use, especially with non-technical clients. Um, has decent out of box accuracy and it's very versatile. We can actually use this for classification or regression. Today, we're gonna to be talking about uh, classification though. And the downsides, like I've said, you have to store all the training data. Um, and references for it to search for a new classification. So it's gonna get computationally expensive pretty quick. Um, so it has a high memory requirement. It can be pretty sensitive to irrelevant features and also to scale variants. So all of you have been with me now for two days, you're gonna know where I'm going with this. Scale your data, people, scale it. Um, would you cover clustering techniques? Yes. So we're gonna be covering uh, unsupervised machine learning starting let me see i'll pull up i'll pull up the um the schedule for you so it looks like we're going to do some of that starting the 27th um so we'll do k-means and we'll do some different kinds of anomaly detection both supervised and unsupervised um but k-means i'll probably i'll probably do k-means and clustering that day um but just unsupervised learning will start the 27th um it's good for me to remember that I should also have a schedule tag now, but I believe my schedule command and stream is still for our normal stream schedule. Um, and lastly, you have to figure out K. So that's, that's the other downside, is that you do have to either systematically or just through intuition figure out K. Don't do it through intuition. There, I'll show you how to systematically figure it out. Give me one second and I will link you to the schedule. Hold please, friends. I posted it on Twitter. Um, Twitter. They're also it the the um I should say. It's also on the GitHub. So um, if you look at the MLMIS GitHub, uh, the schedule's also posted there. Um, Suiku, hold on. So Pokemon that are more green are more likely to be grass type and you can test with Kanan. Well, no, 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 it's not even green. If we were doing Pokemon, green would be grass type, blue would be water type. It's the colors here are relevant. The colors here are, are things that I've just chosen so that we can distinguish between the different groups. Um, but when we, when we get down to it, um, these, these groupings are whatever we decide. And today we're actually going to be talking about plants and groupings of different species of plants. Um, I will be covering reinforcement learning. Uh, that is scheduled for starting the 30th. All right. So as many of you know, I am, I'm struggling a little bit with a cold. So please hold, I'm going to go get some more tea. All right. Um, so that I can keep telling you all about k &N. We're also going to do decision trees today. Um, and when I come back, we will start to dive into the code. So don't go anywhere. Be right back.
All right. I have re-upped my team. Smiling Kenji is like, I'm in the wrong place as all the Pokemon nerds, like, <laughs> come out of the woodwork. Of course, d -Rocks. So in this case, the way that you can think about it, all right, is, is that we're... Again, like with, with all of the mottos that we've been looking at and will look at, we need numerical values. All right. And so maybe, maybe, um, let's, 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 I'm going to make an, an actual, I'm going to try here. So, oh Lord, I'm going to make a fool of myself. So actually let's not do Pokemon. Yeah, let's do Pokemon. So let's say we've got size here and here is like attack power, right? So we are literally plotting these points based on numerical attributes that they have. And then we're trying to see, can we draw boundaries between groups based on various classes? And so what we're going to be looking at today, we're going to be looking at something far more scientific than Pokemon. Actually, it'd be fun if I could find a Pokemon data set. I'll try to for some of our future, future streams. But Really what we're interested in, where are the boundaries between classes? Even if we get some of them wrong, how can we draw the most accurate boundaries between various classes to divide our data up to make predictions? <laughs> what is near? Yes, good job. If I, if I had candy to throw you, mediocre gamer, I would. Um, all right, so... We talked about the pros and cons of KNN as a classification model. We talked about Voronoi diagrams. We talked about how there's different measures for distance. In this particular case, we're going to only think about Euclidean, but you can look up Manhattan, Minkowski, cosine similarity, all kinds of different distances. Oh, tea. Love tea. All right, my friends. So today, we... And 150 seems to be the um, zoom that you all like, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that. Um, all right. So uh, today we are going to be using something called the Iris data set. And so one of the things that I really want to do with these streams is not just introduce you to best practices, my own personal views on how you should use machine learning algorithms and the machine learning algorithms themselves, but also really famous data sets. Because if any of you, you know, have more than a passing interest in machine learning and you want to interview and you, you want to get a job, a lot of times you might be asked, have you worked with these data sets? Have, have these been something that is a part of your education? Because they are very, very famous. The iris data set in particular is about exactly what it sounds like, irises. Um, one of my favorite flowers, actually. And so we're gonna see if we can predict species of iris based off of various um, characteristics of the flower. I know mediocre gamer, you called it. <laughs> so good job, also candy for you. Um, and Nito Dios, you redeemed hydrate with my awesome shark. No, Onatsu, not iris in your eye, iris the flower. So actually, if anyone is not familiar, not the iris data set. I wanted to see if Sklearn had it. So if Scikit-Learn already had it preloaded, because then it makes it a lot easier for you all when I post the GitHub or the, the code to GitHub, because then I don't have to post the, the data myself. You all can just, if you install the scikit-learn library, um, you have access to it. Sable with, pedal with, exactly, CalcMath, you know where I'm going here. This is, um, this is an iris. They're really pretty, whatever. I like the little stripes. In any case, we're gonna be doing some machine, le machine learning with some data all about irises, okay? So let's, let's, let's import, let's import our friends, right? Well, the little the little friends that we've been using. I don't think I use Seaborn, but I always import Seaborn just in case because Seaborn makes some beautiful visualizations. And if you are interested in exploring machine learning, 
scikit-learn has this wonderful data sets module um, that includes some 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 wonderful wonderful data sets um railbird you said as i went outside to look at the great conjunction today you thought of how significant we are in the grand scheme of the universe oh i'm your leading authority on astronomy thank you that is such a sweet message merry christmas and happy new year to you too that like that just that warms my heart you know i've been streaming this this new year's eve by the way is my three years stream anniversary, and for two years i streamed video games to like just half a dozen friends of mine and then this year i really started getting into tech streaming our stream has grown like the community has grown and it's just made it's made me feel especially during the pandemic that you know we ha most of us don't even know each other like we've never met but we have such a wonderful community where we can reach out we can learn from each other where we're all kind of cheering each other on especially in the discord all the amazing projects that i see people working on third tier gaming's coffee bot like it's so wonderful to feel closely connected to people in a time when i don't leave my house ever so thank you all because i think this year would have been a lot harder without the stream community so cheers to you all too hi new coder welcome I don't know if I'd say I'm a leading authority on anything, Onad, but I will take it. All right. So what I was just talking about, my dears, is that we can just do this. Watch this. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, shit. I got overly excited. Aw, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at this. Oh, thank you. ASDF Wendy, are, are you asking to give my dogs treats? Because if you donate at least 100 bits to the channel, you can give my dogs treats. So let's, let's see where they are. It's one of the, the perks, I guess. Is I have this wonderful little dog cam, and if you throw 100 bits at the channel, let's, oh, I see him. He's over here, he's on the couch. Let's see if we can summon him. Hey, Hubble, you want a treat? Oh, <laughs> easy as head. Hmm? Let's see, it depends on how lazy he is. Huffy Bear, how many treats do I have to throw at you? He might be really tired. We did just feed him full of treats. So I'm sorry if he doesn't come. You can see his little key. Oh, 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 anything for food. That's my boy. God, he's so much like me. Good boy. This is Hubble. So whenever you cheer the stream, you cheer my dogs too. And we, uh, we give them treats just for you. Post-holiday, we'll have to be a little careful because he has a little bit of joint problems. So we have to watch his weight. But it's the holidays. We all kind of put on a little bit of some fluff for the holidays. So he's a very good boy. Also, he eats the ornaments, so I have to watch him. Don't eat the ornaments, Hubble. I'm watching you, sir. Anyway, thank you so much for the cheers. 99% supportive, but not to dogs. Cats and Pokemon. Oh, my dogs are wonderful, Suiko. They are, they are perfect. They are perfect snoots. Okay. Tennessee is probably under a blanket. Let's see. What's what's the 10 status here? The 10 status. The Tennessee status is he's under a blanket. <laughs> when it, where Where is 10 ever? Unless I have cheese to bribe him to sing to you, he's going to be under a blanket. All right. So what I was talking about is that Scikit-Learn has this wonderful data sets module that you could all use. Just load and your data set. This is what we used for the Boston housing data set as well two days ago. So we're gonna take advantage of this um, and use it for use it for our iris data set. Thank you, Gaia's first night for following. All right, so now we got our data. Here's what it looks like. We're missing, we're missing our, um, our label. So let's get that. How do I combine powerlifting and some genetic connective tissue disease? Really quick, D rocks. You say any traffic model data sets in there? I would look on Kaggle. So when you want to go to like the wonderful sort of, you know, Walmart, but I guess Walmart has Costco. I like Costco. Costco is better. They pay their employees much better. So the Costco of data sets is Kaggle. Um, and you don't have to pay. 
there are data sets for everything you can think about. So I would check there. Um, the most famous, highly balanced, clean data sets for machine learning will often be in the scikit-learn data sets um, module. But if you're looking for data sets that maybe are you just want to use for yourself, I would look at Kaggle. Um, but to answer your question, Strawberry Jesus, uh, we'll have a slight we'll, we'll have a slight tangent here while I drink some tea. Um, the problem that I have with my connective tissue actually has to do with a protein collagen, and the essentially my DNA is is a little bit <laughs> it's a little bit different. It's 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 shit um, when it comes to building collagen. So DNA being um, the blueprint for for building proteins and amino acids and things. Um, my blueprint for collagen is raw, so my body builds bad collagen. Um, so collagen is in a lot of different things. It's in your eyes, it's in your skin, it's in all of your organs. Um, very similar to Marfan's, absolutely. Um, and I see Yogi, I will link you, well, I will, I will be uploading the code after the stream. And if the data is not available through scikit-learn, I will upload the data as well. Um, you can also just go to Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E, and uh, look, and just seriously, some of the famous ones like Boston Housing, Titanic Dataset, you just say Kaggle and that, it pops up. Um, there are lots of Pokemon datasets on Kaggle. I have a chunk of my computer's hard drive is devoted to looking through many different Pokemon datasets on Kaggle. But to finish answering uh, Strawberry Jesus, uh, one of the things that normal people's collagen does for them is it holds your joints in place. So, you know, like your shoulder is ball, ball and socket joint, okay? And what kind of determines that your shoulder should move like this and not like this is your collagen in your connective tissue. It holds your body together. If you have really shitty connective tissue, like most people have rubber bands, I kind of have tissue paper. It's a bad situation. One of the best things that you can do is to build muscle. I have to go a little bit slower and a lot more careful than most people. I have to brace things a lot sooner than most power lifters. But what I found is that of every single thing, including uh, like pharmaceutical interventions I've tried, uh, weightlifting has been the thing that has made the biggest uh, quality of life change for me. Because the more muscle I have, the stronger, like my muscles kind of are able to take over where the connective tissue doesn't, doesn't work so well. And so um, powerlifting is really great. If you're, if you're able to do it, it helps a lot. Um, keeps you strong, allows your muscles to sort of take over when your ligaments are being jerks. So yeah. The op Marfins is the opposite. Marfins, I don't know too, too much about it, but Marfins also has a lot to do with proportionality, right? So that's where you have like really long fingers, you're often very tall, um, but it is also a connective tissue disease that is closely related to the mutations that my particular disease has as well. So today you learned. So what we're gonna be looking to predict with our K nearest neighbors classifier is the species of the iris. So we're going to get that from our iris data set as well. Right. And now if we look at our data, that's not how we spell that. You'll see we have sepal length, sepal width, petal, sepal is some, I, it's one of the sex organs of a plant, right? Is that like the, that's like the, interior part that has the pollen on it, right? Anyway, petal length, petal width, and species. Um, and the various species that we're going to be trying to predict are Setosa versicolor and Virginica. Um, plants do have sex. If you wanna know what pollen is, Google it. It's, there's there's actually, what's the, what's the, oh, hold on. Lofum, what's, what, what's, oh, you would know. What is the, the, I can't believe I'm embarrassing myself like this, but what's the plant bukake? Is it just, <laughs> I've got to pull up. That made someone follow. Uh, Belladay91, thank you for following. Um, there was, I was I was very upset at having allergies at some point. And so it's, I think it's Nightbot. It's one of our custom things in Nightbot. 
Okay, apparently it's not bukkake. What did I call it? Is it plant something? I totally made it a command. Didn't I? Did I not? Can you find that that clip, Loaf Bone? It's one of the like people's favorites. I thought I made it into a command, but I guess not. Um, it's not <laughs> Bukake made a fucking command. Um, it's check yeah. Like, can you find it, Loaf Bone? It's in the it's in the like the the Twitch clips. Um, we are classifying plants by the size of their sex organs. Something does not seem right, and their petals. Don't be hating. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, we're going to do a couple of checks that we often do with our data, right? The first is our check for class balance, right? Well, don't you fear, my friends. This is a perfectly clean data set just for you. So you don't have to worry about class imbalance. Um, yeah, can you just find the clip? Froke, thank you for following. Sepals, are they not? What's the, oh, I swear I was, what is a sepal? Okay, I thought that was, all right, so they're at the base near where the stamen come out. And I was thinking of stamen, not sepal. So thank you for the correction. No, we're not judging plants by their, the size of their, their reproductive parts. Um, so there you go, we're being very equitable. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> it's plants, people. Sit down. And unless you've seen Farscape, in which case I understand being a little sexually confused by plants, you don't have anything to say. All right. We also want to check out what's null in our data set. Nothing, because we're dealing with the world's most perfect data set. Yes, this is the clip, by the way. Oh, my God. It's been forever. Hold on. Yes, let's add the Christmas music. Was this doom? I feel like this was doom. And also, I think I had a cold. I was very upset at allergies You're this day. Not like some, like, bukake sort of situation, I thought. Well, I guess it's plant bukake. <laughs> yeah, okay. I remember this. I didn't want to jump down from here. I found this little hidey hole. And there were, like, all these monsters. Anyway, in which case, the, the gaming streams we do are a little bit not safe for work, just as a heads up. Um... Anar Chooser, thank you for following. Um, that should just be slight warning for stream. I try to keep the educational stuff more open to all, all ages, but video games, I'm I'm relaxing. I'm going to be more myself, and I'm a little bit of a crass human. Suiku's redeeming no cursing. So those of you who don't know about this redemption, if I swear during the no cursing time, I gift you a sub. So no cursing for five minutes. I can curse again at 8.48, no problem. I'm in educational mode. I can um, can turn that kind of my brain off. All right, so let's take a look at our data. All right, so let's 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 plot this data. We're gonna make a scatter plot, all right, of our data. Um, we're gonna look at our petal length. And we're gonna plot it against one of our other features, which is our petal width. Just let's let's just let's just see if there are some relationships, all right? And we are gonna color this. What color map did I use? I made this very pretty. Oh, you little poop. No. I wrote down because I always forget what color maps to use. Whatever. I'll copy paste. Um, our color. What we're gonna want to color by is species, and then we're gonna use blue, red, and green. So so this should kind of remind you a little bit of the Voronoi diagrams we were making earlier. Yes, this is a wonderful data set often used for classification. So we have some pretty easy decision boundaries that even if we wanted to be like very prescriptive about it, we could, we could draw these lines ourselves, right? Um, holy moly mo, thank you for following. Um, what, when did Justin Bieber start? Coding. I don't think I look like Justin Bieber, but I guess that's a compliment, I guess, because he's like famous, right? I think he has a beard now, though. No matter how hard I try, I just can't. I'm sorry. A heat map. What kind of heat map are you thinking, Mr. Claude? If you let me know what kind of heat map you want, we were doing those for our correlation, 
our correlation matrices yesterday we used we used some heat maps to look at that um we can we can i've got a data frame now so we can look at that um gm drop thank you for following so one of the great things that we can do with pandas is we can look at the correlation oh my goodness holy moly mo 25 subs thank you thank you so much what a wonderful holiday gift to the stream thank you holy moly literally mvp thank you so incredibly much oh my goodness all of you whether you sub once you donate a bunch of subs i hope you know how much it means because it really does help me get cool things like a green screen or the furbo so you can give my dogs treats um fun stream things but also i hope you know i put a lot of work into these streams making them good for you so i really really appreciate it um thank you so much and now all 25 of you who got subs you're stuck with me you can't leave now forever you're stuck uh, Caesar, I will hydrate. Um, thank you. Sorry, I can't ever leave. <laughs> now you're trapped. You're trapped with me. Um, thank you, Holy Moly Mo, for the support. Oh my goodness. Aww. I get like shy when people do things like this. I'm like, can I hide under my desk and go back to the math? Thank you so much. Seriously, I can't express to you how wonderful that is. I've been a very, very small stream for many years, and so it means quite a bit. Thank you. Um, but let's give, uh, who was asking? Um, I got distracted by the, um, Mr. Claude was asking for a heat map. So here you go, Mr. Claude. This heat map is just for you, my friend. A heat map of the correlation coefficients of all of our feature vector elements. What? So check this out. You can definitely see that we've got some strong correlations here, which if we're doing KNN, we don't really mind so much. So we're going to leave it for now. If you're interested in learning more about uh, what models might you might want to clean some of this out, look at the linear regression and logistic regression videos from day one and day two. But I did this just for you. So there you go, Mr. Claude. You have a heat map just for you. All right. Well, let's, 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 you know what? We're already almost two hours in. I got to get up early to talk to math students about math. So let's get on with building our KNN because I have one more model for you after this. Get excited. All right. Let's prepare our feature vector. All right. So we are going to want to have it be everything but the species, right? Because that's what we're trying to predict. And our Y here is gonna be species. Okay? No, it's not almost over, Onad. I'm, this one might be a little bit longer than our other ones. I've been trying to keep myself to two hours, but today I crammed in a bunch of cool stuff to show you guys. So it might be a little bit longer. It's all good. We're about halfway through. So I might have to go a little faster through decision trees than I would have anticipated. Um, but it's okay. We're gonna we're gonna make it work. All right, so who knows what comes next? At this point, I think I've like hammered it into all of your skulls. What do we need to do after we make our feature vector? Always, always, always. I'm gonna like this is gonna be engraved on my tombstone. What do we have to do? I feel like this is literally my, not just shuffle, scale. Onad is like, you are here for me, my friend. Scale your data. Always, always, always. Scale it, scale it. Yes, strawberry Jesus. Day, day to kiss. Y'all are, you're getting it. All right, so. Here it matters a little less that we shuffle because we are going to be, um, well, you still should always shuffle your data, but here it matters a little bit less. Um, I tend to scale first, then shuffle. But yes, Jay Hint, everyone. So I can go to the bakery directly after the stream on. Here it is 3 a.m. So NKL, I used to work at a bakery and my favorite, favorite shift was the, um, I worked the 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift and I loved it because we would just put on music. I would just sit, like not sit, stand there my poor joints, but still I just focus on, well, bakeries, so you have to bake things right fresh in the morning, right? 
So a lot of times we're baking things off four or five in the morning. So the shift that ended at 6 a.m. did the vast majority of the baking. My shift was more about the mixing and the pastry. And Mediocre Gamer, you can do it. Um, you don't make a lot of money, but I loved the work. Very, very, unfortunately, everything I seem to love is 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 mostly male-dominated. So the uh, you wouldn't think so, right? Bakery seems like something that is somehow more more feminine but yet uh professionally at least um it's mostly mostly men um which can be can be a little bit hard if you are not uh I loved it though like just put on the music I had this great boss like there was this jerk boss who was who was who was not very nice but he would leave at around 8 p.m 8 to 10 p.m and then the nice boss would come in and he and I would just listen to music and mix bread and talk and I loved it it was so great and every day I went home and I smelled like cinnamon, sugar, and butter. And it was just like, life Life was good. There was, some, there was a really funny video of me somewhere on the internet. Uh, we had this very old antique roll splitter. So you would take this big load, of like pounds and pounds of dough, and you'd spread it on this thing. Oh, like seriously, it looks like from the 1800s. And heavy cast iron and you'd like pull it over you'd have to lock it and I'm, I'm a smaller human so I'd have to kind of like put one foot on it grab this big crank kind of like jump and like slam it as hard as I could to get it to cut the rolls and there's like a dorky video of me somewhere having to do that and then being super excited that the rolls all came out really nice um anyway what do we do what do we do after we scale our data we 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 train test, split it, duh. We know now. We've been through two days of this. We know better. I think it's on, I don't know where it is. It was on Facebook for a little bit, I think. It might be on YouTube. I'll, pro I'll dig it up for you. I'll put it on Discord if I can find it. It's like 19-year-old me, though, so back when I was young. <laughs> um, we know now we're not going to fit the whole model on our entirety of our data set. We know better. We are going to train, test, split our data because we now we now know what we're doing. We're not going to we're not going to make the mistakes that we made day 1. So, let's just I don't How many nearest neighbors do we pick? I don't, I don't know. Let's pick one. What's the worst that could happen? suspicious of this are we and Nicholas VV thank you for following oh oh nad we're getting there we're getting there my friend hold hold that that question hold it because we'll get there so how much do we trust this <laughs> I fooled you all so much I did not shuffle we're not gonna be shuffling today I promise it doesn't matter too too much right now for this data set I would say for other data sets go for it shuffle this one is just so pristine don't don't worry too much about it. All right. I'm a little suspicious too because hold please. What the hell changed? Use the same random state. So, this is how little you should you should you should trust this. Is that when I ran this right before stream to make sure my code wasn't borked? I got an accuracy of 76%. Now we have 95%. Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. Um, let's try, let's try some, some, some other stuff though. Also shuffle your data. Oh, it helps when you spell things correctly, does it not? Nate bores. All right. Um. <sighs> boop, 
Bloop, bloop. Interesting. Hmm. Give me one sec here, friends, actually, because I am gonna be a little bit stubborn about something. <laughs> oh, thank you for following EMRCDR. Thank you, thank you. Um. There absolutely is cross validation. Sklern dot did I spell this wrong? Validation. Sklern. Oh no. Did I upgrade? This might be old. I always poop on a butt. Alright, hold on. Um Again, we're hitting the jazz. This means like we're near the end of our, our playlist. Um. Oh, it's model selection now, isn't it? Oh my God, isn't it? Not cross-validation anymore. Yep, okay, there we go. All right, so. Um, we'll just do five. I think there's a random state here. Probably. No, there isn't. Oh yeah, and we, hell yes, we would like to shuffle is true. Thank you. Okay, so then. Some way to do this. Um, there's multiple ways to do this, let me think. Um, mm, uh, let's see, hold on. Why did they change the name? Um, it probably was just uh, an upgrade, like an update. Um, and for X and range, you could fit the model over and over. Absolutely. So we're going to do that eventually, Mediocre Gamer, to find our ideal K. Um, uh, why is the random state 322? Because that's my birthday. So that is the random state that I always use. Because <laughs> it's my birthday and I just... That's what I want to use. Um, let me look through... This gives me my indices. I haven't done this before, like, not before, in a while. Um, so I think we're gonna have our X train, our X test here is gonna be X train, and then our X test, and then we're gonna have Y train, Y test is gonna be the same thing. So I think, I think this gives us just indices, if I'm remembering correctly. And then we're gonna have our beautiful K and N. We're gonna fit our X train. That's not what I wanted. X train, Y train. And then we are going to have our predictions just like we did before. And then we're gonna, Y prediction, no. We're gonna have that equal K and N dot predict x test and then we are going to have our just print for now eh, let's be reasonable hold on 
Give me one sec here, friends. Um, no metrics. Accuracy. Oops. I'm thinking it's. So that's our average um, across five K fold, five fold cross validation. So these are blue switches. I'm sorry, stream. I wanted to just kind of like go in the zone for a second and figure out how we would do this. Um, I'm checking up on chat right now. And so this, this, as we've learned from previous streams, this is the score that we believe a little bit more, right? Cause we've cross validated it. Um, but this is a great average. This is so much better of an average than we're used to. Um, and that kind of gets back to what I was talking about earlier with like out of the box, K nearest neighbors, K nearest neighbors is pretty, pretty baller. Um, oh my gosh, I literally have this being some, no, I wrote some code to do something else. Okay. I thought that I wrote code to do that. And I was like, why did I, why did I sit here and have to do this off the top of my head? I wrote notes to follow so I wouldn't get distracted. All right. But now, to get to many people's questions about this, how do we figure out what K to use? Pfft. Let's not figure out what K to use. Come on, let's make the computer do it. Um, K neighbors classifier. Nearest neighbors is going to be K. Mm, no, I'm not going to sneeze. Hold on. I told you, this is my trick. If I push on my nose, I don't sneeze. Ha! I beat it. Oh, yeah, no worries. Okay, bye, Matt. Thank you so, so, so much for stopping by. This one's going a little longer than usual. I try to keep them to two hours, but... Classification is important. Um, I didn't think I was overly distracted today either. So when I am on breaks from work, I don't take my ADHD meds. Um, but I feel like I've been very good. Uh, but I think I just planned too much content for today because I got overly excited. I was like, I should tell them about KNN and decision trees. So whatever. yesterday I didn't like I thought it was a little short. Today it's too long. Y'all are y'all are patient with me. So. It'll, it'll all be good, except for dead squirrels. That was, that was, that was a brief tangent. It was. <laughs> Thank you, Halloween Core, for, for following. Um, Spell wrong. What did I spell? I did something goofy here. Columns are K. K is where you, where are you upset at me? Blah 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 blah. Poop on you. Oh, because I changed the name of this later. Cause as you know, I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep calling everything data because I'm responsible. I'm gonna teach these people how to name their stuff right. And then I'm looking at my notes and I'm like, I'm just gonna copy from my notes. Get in trouble, friends, when you try to be good. What do you? Stop that! Stop that! Stop that! Why is there brackets here? Just score. 
Will you just make my damn plot? Thank you. All right. So, um, I am writing, overwriting my test data. I am planning on doing that because I wanted fresh tests each time. So do not worry, that was intentional. So here's, here's, here's kind of what we're looking at. We've got different results for different Ks, but you can see that once we hit a certain point, our K kind of drops off. So we know, we know, okay, past 60, we're, we're, we don't really want to go beyond this. So let's, uh, let's look at something else though. So thank you, Gray Jack. They're actually uh, Christmas ornaments. And so what we're going to do here is, let's see, since we're actually a little bit low on time, let's, let's, let's maybe skip some of this. I might copy my code from my notes a little bit. All right. And this way we can move a little faster. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at our training error, our testing error, and we're going to compare those for all values of K between one and a hundred. So here we were just looking at our score. We we're looking at our accuracy, but now we're going to look at our error, which is a little bit different. So that's our one minus our accuracy. It's a little bit different. Um, and from here, we're going to make ourselves a little bit of a data frame, right? Just a little bit of our pandas data frame from our training and testing error to compare for all 100K. We're going to look at our training and testing errors. So let's plot this. Let's take a look at what this looks like. So now we want a lower error. Again, we're seeing kind of, again, it's one minus, right? So we're gonna see the inverse of the plot we just saw. We're seeing the same thing, we expected this. After a certain number, our error is just going through the roof. Okay, so what, what's, what's, what's the best option here though? So it looks like our best, this is claiming our best option is one, which it's being a little bit of a, hmm, that's surprising, anyway. Here, training error will decrease as our model complexity increases, all right? And testing error is gonna be minimized when we have kind of reached our, our peak or our, op, like our optimal model complexity. Um, if we have a much lower training error than testing error, we've probably overfit, right? Because that means we're performing so much better in the training than we are testing. And that's, that's kind of the, the red flag for us. Um, nevertheless, though, if we go all the way back up here, you can see that like, even just our out of the box testing of what does one nearest neighbor look like? What does five nearest neighbors look like? I pretty much do one of these graphs every time I do K nearest neighbors for a range of K and N, usually much bigger than 100 depends on the data set size actually. So if we go really, what did I name the data? Data, huh. So we only have 150 data points. So 100 groups, that is far too much complexity. So it depends on the size of your data set as well. But nevertheless, doing a simple kind of like iterative test of a variety of different K values and seeing where, where am I losing, you know, because you have to balance that, um, is pred equal, equals Y test not leading to evaluation instead of assign the value. Um, it is leading to evaluation because it's a double equal sign and not a single, which would assign the value. Um, nevertheless, the point here is that you have a trade-off. It's not just about accuracy. And I think I've kind of also hammered that into all of your <laughs> heads by now, especially with our conversation about metrics yesterday, that it's so much more than just accuracy, right? We could, I could have 100% accuracy on my training data and that could mean my model's horrifically overfit. And if I try to um, apply, apply it to new data, it's gonna, it's gonna tank. So the point is to have a balance between model complexity and performance. If your model's overly complex, a lot of times that's gonna lead to overfitting. Remember, our, our point is here to generalize trends in our model, to apply those to new data and to get valuable, meaningful results. If we overfit to our 150 data points we're given now, when they discover some new iris and they wanna know what species it is, 
we're gonna be shit out of luck. We're not gonna be able to apply it to a new, a new, um, we're not gonna be able to apply our model to, to new data points unless we're able to generalize. Um, the real Pygon, thank you for following. So, um, you might also see both of those errors plateauing at some point. And if it plateaus, that means that your model is likely, um, it's likely going to be underfitting. It's not complex enough. So you might have to tweak your parameters a little bit. Uh, TZT KRISI, thank you for following. And also Plawpeg, thank you for following. All right, so we are gonna move on to decision trees. All right, so I'm actually gonna pull back up our, not that, um, yay, 100, thank you so much, the real Pygon. Is that a 100 bits to give the dogs treats? Um, Cause I can definitely, I can pull them. Let's see, are they around? They might not be. I think, I think Hubble's on the couch. So if I can see him, I think he's over here on the couch. Let's see if he comes up. Cause that's one of the perks of my stream is if you cheer me with bits, you cheer my dogs. Um, let's see. Oh, his head popped up. So he heard the machine. He's also had a lot of treats. So I'm sorry, this is way more treats than he normally gets. So if he doesn't come off of the couch, I apologize. I'll try one more time. Little boy. Oh no, he is, he is, he is, he is passed out. Oh, oh, no, no. We've awoken the dragon. Incoming Hubble. Here you go, 100 bits. He is, he is coming to eat the treats you have supplied. Thank you. He's a very good boy. He's a very, very, very good boy. So thank you, thank you for the cheers. Thank you for giving my dog treats, especially with our, our busier streams. He's gonna be a chonky boy if I'm not careful. So <laughs> he's, he's a precious, precious, precious boy. Um, and at the end of stream, you'll be able to meet my other dog because he sings for us. He loves to serenade us at the end of the night. Okay, so let's talk decision trees. Um, I'm gonna move through this a little bit faster because also I planned for two hours of content and we are over that, that, that mark a little bit and I have to get up at the butt crack of dawn. So I'm gonna move a little bit faster. All right, decision trees. Decision trees. Like K nearest neighbors, they are also non parametric models for those of you who are here for the start of the stream they're not making assumptions about the distribution of our data decision trees can also handle regression and classification <laughs> yes let's hug some trees oh thank you dave yeah uh this is pandemic haircut you know i shaved it completely off in august so that was fun um one of the great things about decision trees you don't need a lot of info about the data. Just like KNN. This is one of those models you can throw at the wall and see what sticks. So let's 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 kind of examine though what this would look at. Look like. So if we're making a decision tree for should I go for a walk? So maybe what's the first thing, what's the first thing that we might in our decision-making process ask ourselves? It might be, is it raining? That's a big one, right? Or yeah, kind of the opposite of paranoid Polaroid is the sun shining, right? So we'll have a yes have a no probably knowing me and my own lady laziness this is going to lead to a no label um but or oopsies i i, I inverted that hold on <laughs> i am a little bit lazy i'm not that lazy all right if it is raining this will lead to a no label otherwise we might ask ourselves um what's the next question is it hot? So like greater than 
85 Fahrenheit. <laughs> Just making me look like a complete lazy sh schlob. Um, and if it's not too, if it's not too hot, let's ask ourselves, is it humid? I don't know what a measurement of humid, humid is, so I'm not going to try to look, look ridiculous here, but if it's humid, maybe we also say no. Otherwise, we say yes. This is the basic intuition behind a decision tree. Um, hold, I know. Y'all are like, oh no, isn't this just a bit, bunch of if-else? Hold, please, because we have a much more, here's, here's the assumption though. You are absolutely right if we know what questions to ask. But if I have that iris data set, right, that we were just looking at with a bunch of like sepal widths and petal lengths and stuff that I don't even know what it means, how do I know what questions we should split on? What should be the first question? What should be the second question? How do we determine when to split and when not to? So it's not so much an if then. If we knew all of the rules, absolutely. Also, we need more music, so hold on. Let's restart our wonderful Christmas playlist here. If we knew all the questions, we could just write an if then. However, 99.9999999% of the time, we're not gonna know what questions to ask. And that's where the beauty of a decision tree comes in. So, um, for example, I actually have an image to show you of a pretty famous decision tree. Just thinking about it. All right. So this is a decision tree for an election. Um, the Obama-Clinton divide, I guess this is for maybe for the uh, determining who would be the Democratic nominee, right? And so a decision tree determining, oopsies, who would win which counties, Obama versus Clinton. So you might ask yourself, how do they know what questions to ask? Did somebody go through here and test each question, guess and check? That is a complicated, computationally long way to go about it. So, there's a better way. But this is also showing you that decision trees have been used for a lot of really important predictions and a lot of really important analysis as to you know what, what things get classified with which labels. So this was my like very easy example, but we can, um, we can use decision trees to really model very complicated decision processes. Just like with our, um, our wonderful KNN classifier. Uh, they're understandable, they're explainable, they're intuitive. We don't need too, too much computation with these ones. Um, and they give us a good idea of feature importance. What's the first split? What's the first question we ask? A lot of times that's the one that's the most important. Um, however, they can be computa computationally expensive to train, just like our KNN classifier. And they can be prone to errors if there are too many classes or we have too little training data, which honestly you could say about pretty much any machine learning algorithm. Low order bit and Pikachu. Thank you for following. I want to know how the, the closed captions do with me trying to like guess what, the, what people's names are. All right. So I think one of the um, one of the most intuitive questions following up right after we've seen these decision trees. The question, at least on my mind, when I first learned about decision trees was how do you determine the questions? And again, we're running out of time here. So um, one of the ways that you can do this is entropy. I was going to go into entropy and information gain and all of that. Um, oh my goodness, reboot. Thank you so much for the donation. Thank you so much. You have a wonderful holiday too. I'm so glad. Thank you for showing appreciation. I 
love machine learning and I love telling all of you about it and I'm putting in a lot of work to make these streams good. So your donation means so, so, so much. So thank you. You have now topped our leaderboard of the most donations. So cheers to you friend and uh, have, have a wonderful holiday. Um, and thank you Dave Sec OS for following. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over entropy and information game to talk about what we're gonna be using. This will be in the notes though, okay? So do not panic if you're like, oh, but I wanna learn about entropy. This is me just being respectful of the fact I have to get up very early tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Um, and I don't want to disappoint all of these high school math students by being half asleep. Uh, but when I post the notes, I promise you there will be mathematical explanations of entropy and information game. A uh, knife juggler, thank you for following. Uh, Jay Hendu says, so are trees just inherently more computationally heavily heavy? Yeah. Compared to a lot of other lightweight models, these ones are a little bit, a little bit heftier. They're, they're hefty boys. Um, what we're going to be using is not entropy or information game. And Scaligula, that's an excellent name. Uh, thank you for following. An acrimonic, the notes will be on GitHub. So after each stream, I post the code that we've done together. The notes are gonna take more formatting. I want them to be pretty. There's LaTeX for your math equations. It's gonna be gorgeous. Those are happening after the event. So the 12 days of machine learning, during that time, I will be posting most likely just the code. Um, and then when I have some spare time to catch my breath and sleep, uh, I will be making some beautiful notes for all of you with visualizations and wonderful formatting and everything. Those will be posted after the event. Okay. So what we're gonna be using is the Gini index. Or Gini, I guess I've never heard this said out, said out loud. Um, nevertheless, uh, it's fine. Seriously, entropy and information gain, Gini index, they're both used by very, very, very prominent decision tree algorithms. They're both equally wonderful, used in slightly different applications. But um, for today, we're gonna be using the Gini index. And so what we do here, the Gini index is gonna represent the probability that if we pick an element at random, what is the likelihood that we have classified it incorrectly? And in math language, what that's gonna look like is one minus, one minus because we want it wrong, okay? The sum, right? Because we're adding up the probability, the P, the probability that our given data is a wrong class squared because we're kind of penalizing it a little bit more. All right, so actually I think this is, sorry, I think this is actually the correct class because we're doing one minus, yeah. So if we, what is the probability, one minus here, right? So the probability if we get it right is like, let's say our probability of getting it right is 90%. Well, then our probability of getting it wrong is one minus, which is 10%. So that's the one minus the sum that given some data, we are gonna classify it incorrectly. That's what this is just coming down to. What is the probability we've classified something, classified a random something incorrectly. How do you pronounce Ginny? I don't know. I say Ginny, I've actually never heard it said out loud now that I think about it, I've just read it. Okay, so the great thing about this, we wanna minimize, we wanna minimize this value, okay? Because really what we're talking about is, if you think about it like this, if our data was perfectly ordered, if all of, if all of our data was the same thing. So let's say I have, I have 50 dogs. <laughs> The amount of disorder entropy, I don't want to go too, too much into entropy, but the amount of entropy, the amount of disorder in this is, is zero because they all have the same label. If I have 25 dogs and 25 cats perfectly split, that is our max entropy. We are perfectly split between the two. Ideally, what we want to do is want to be splitting so that we are minimizing the amount of disorder. In this case, if we pick a random, a random class, we want to minimize the likelihood that we've um, 
we have labeled that data incorrectly. So we wanna be making intelligent splits so that when we pick something from our subsample, it's more likely that we've classified that correctly. I see Yogi, thank you so much for subscribing. Um, all right, so let's, let's, let's get to the code here, all right? Um, I know we're moving a little, little fast with the decision trees. I'm sorry, friends, the detailed notes, I promise will go into entropy and all of that wonderfulness. Um, but I, I'm, I'm running a little low on the time that I usually use. Um, thank you, Jolty29, for following. All right, so we're gonna need, we're gonna need our decision tree. Oh, and if I didn't say it already, decision trees like Cayenne and uh, can be used for both classification and regression. Let me move this out of the way so I can type a little faster. All right. And then plot tree. Okay. So we're going to have our wonderful decision tree classifier. We're going to give it a random state, as we always do, my birthday. Um, and let's fit it to our data that we've already trained, test, splitted because we're smart humans. And let's see, out of the box, not really messing with it too terribly much. What do we get? Not bad, not bad, right? Also, please, 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 please understand friends that a large component of this is how beautiful this data set is. We have perfect class balance. We have beautifully cleaned data. This data set is literally designed to be used to teach people how to do classification. In real life, not to break your hearts, but you won't see numbers this good. Unless you've done some beautiful hyperparameter tuning or you've won the like jackpot when it comes to data. Data's messy. Data's, if, if you wanna be a machine learning developer, a lot of times I would say probably 75 to 80% of your job, if not more, is understanding, cleaning, and prepping the data unless you have some like wonderful little lackeys to do it for you. And then the rest of the time is, well, some of that time is probably spent doing business development, negotiating with clients, all the rest of the admin work, and a precious few percent of your time is actually spent building the algorithms. So, bye Nito. Yeah, I'm so glad, um, I'm so glad you stopped by. I will see you day after tomorrow, hopefully. Hi, Last Smiles. I know, it's my it's my Christmas earrings. They're uh, literally just ornaments I stole off my tree. Okay. Um, we can also be really strict with ourselves and say, is it just, is it last training test validation? Actually, I think you're right, Phenomenus. Hold, so hold on, let's go back and let's steal our code from here. Let's redo this, because I think you're right. I was moving a little bit fast and you're probably right. So let's let's just let's just make sure we're being smart here. So a little bit lower. No worries. We still have some pretty good pretty good accuracy, but we should also be we didn't kful like we didn't cross validate this. We were a little suspicious of this number. One of the important things that you can do with your decision tree classifiers is you should limit your depth, right? Because this is what prevents our overfitting. If our trees are too shallow, they're not specific enough, they can't fit the complexity of the situation. If they're overly deep, we have overfit the situation. So let's see what this looks like. I put a caps where there shouldn't be one. Um, oh, there's so many goofs. What happens when I start to move fast? All right, not too, too much, actually exactly the same. Um, totally fine, so it must have actually converged on a depth of five. However, one of the cool things that you can do, all right, that I wanna show you, that I love about decision trees. Well, that's gross. I think if I put the print statement, I might do some formatting. Yes. Look, look, look. We can visualize the decisions being made. This is huge for machine learning explainability, right? Because if you want, if you have clients like I have had who were scared when I put plus signs on a whiteboard telling me that there was too much math, a decision tree has this intuitive kind of understanding. We've seen them in infographics. They're not scary. We kind of understand that even if we're not technical people, that decisions follow processes that might have branches, right? 
So we can even make this less scary for our non-technical clients uh, by plotting it with some prettiness. Let's make it big. We want, we want a chunky, chunky fig size here. So we can see what we're doing. Um, so let's plot our tree instead. A little finicky beforehand. All right, so not the prettiest. Let's 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 crank this a little bit wider now. Um, for some reason, it's doing the same thing as doing right before stream and not giving me the lines because it's a butt face. But what what is this telling us? It's telling us the most important decision we can make when classifying these species of plants is the petal length. And once we have that, we can split on other decisions. So we have our tree. You can literally extract from this model a visualization of the decision-making process that's happening. That's huge for explainability. Like this is, I can't tell you how incredibly useful this is, that these kinds of complex decision, those decision boundaries that we were talking about mapping earlier, we can just yank them out of the model, put them on a piece of paper and show people that helps immensely when you're trying to justify why to use this model to people who are like, code, what are you doing? I don't trust it. I don't understand it, so I don't trust it. This helps build that understanding. Happy puppy, thank you for following. And so with that, I am going to wrap things up just a little bit. Um, this kind of covers two really popular classification models. We'll, we'll switch to our, our just chatting a little bit. Um, this covers two really popular classification models, um, K nearest neighbors and decision trees, both of which can be used for regression as well. We're gonna be uh, exploring some fun with our decision trees in uh, how many days? Oh, two days, that's our next stream. Good job, me. Uh, where we're gonna be taking our decision trees, we're gonna be leveling them up and we're gonna be making random forests. And this is where we take a whole bunch of decision trees. We're gonna smush them together and we're gonna see what happens when we do what's called machine learning model ensembling. It'd be really cool. Oh my goodness, Ty. Oh, your name is hard, friend. Hold on, I got this. Ty Yoanoe, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome raiders, all of you. Welcome to the party. We have just finished learning about K nearest neighbors and decision tree classification models in machine learning. Um, we talked about how to visualize them, how to interpret them, how to apply them to our data sets. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of teasing a little bit of what's gonna happen on Wednesday, which is learning, um, learning about ensembling. So we're gonna take the decision trees, the simple, explainable, wonderfully easy decision trees we just did, and we're gonna make it a little bit harder. And <laughs> we're gonna ensemble them and we're gonna make random forests, uh, which is gonna be lots of fun. But so I know we, we cover decision trees lightning fast because I spent way too much time on K nearest neighbors. It's close to my heart. When we do anomaly detection, we'll talk about wonderful ways to make K nearest neighbors faster, more elegant, shall we say. And, and the math is gonna get harder, but the model itself is gonna get better. Um, but are there, are there questions? How do, how do people feel about our deep dive into classification? Yesterday we did logistic regression, so it was a little bit of a, a soft intro to classification, but today we really dived in. Oh my goodness, thank you, Loaf Bone. Thank you for five subs donation to the stream. We have now Colonel Image, the Outlandish, Nairo4, Lizard Pythonic, excellent name, and the Sysop. Thank you so much, now you're stuck with me. So you have to stick around. Um, we are doing the 12 days of machine learning, miss. Um, you can see over yes, here, <laughs> our schedule. So we're gonna be covering all kinds of wonderful things about machine learning. We've covered so far linear regression, logistic regression and classification. So check out the VODs if those are interesting topics for you. Tomorrow I'm Skyping into some high school math classes, so I'm not going to be streaming, uh, but we'll be coming back Wednesday to talk about ensembling and random forest models. 
So before before we wrap things up for the evening, uh, what questions do you have? Is there anything I could help answer? Something we maybe went through a little quickly. I'll tell you probably to wait if it's about decision trees because we'll have another deep dive with Random Forests. We'll answer more questions. We'll I'll save some of the entropy talk for then. Um, but if you have questions about KNN, about any of the regression or classification stuff we've done so far, this is this is your time. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Don't hold your peace till Wednesday, but or talk in the Discord. Mm. So random state NKL is because especially if we're shuffling our data, that shuffle is attempting to approximate randomness. True randomness is a little bit more complicated, but because we're kind of trying to approximate randomness, we can um, save exactly that state, our, our approximation of randomness, we can save that state in case we need reproducibility, which is really, really important, right? So if I write some code, and I'm like, hey, here's what I got. And you're like, I think this person's, you know, I don't think they're, they're doing it right. I need to check what they're doing and see if I get the same results. You need to know the random state for what I did. You need to know, you need to have those approximated random states. You need to know what they are so that you can see if you can reproduce what I've done. Thank you, Phenomus, fen fen for following. Kept make, wanting to make that phenomenon, but it wasn't. Hopefully between now and Wednesday, I can also kick this cold. So I'm not like gulping down tea in between questions. Why does K nearest neighbors work in, work worse in higher dimensions than linear regression? So super boo web. Part of that is because it's tough because it's one of the strengths of k-nearest neighbors, right? We talked earlier about how it's a non-parametric model. We don't really have this training phase. But the downside of that is that k-nearest neighbors has to hold all of that information about the data in memory, which means when our data gets really, really big, our dimensionality gets really, really big. Um, as it's making those distance calculations and adding more and more data, it's going to perform worse. Also, because... When you're thinking about, and, and this is a bit hard to explain without visuals, so bear with me. And I'm not gonna doodle it because I can't draw in like 70 dimensions, um, sadly. But when you have uh, highly dimensional data, what you run into is that a particular data point, if you have a lot of like extraneous dimensions that are in there, so parts of your feature vector that are relevant but still are in there, what you're going to run into is that a single data point is going to appear close to multiple other data points, even when it isn't because of those um, extraneous dimensions. So data cleaning is really needed there or some kind of dimensionality reduction. So it's like one part memory management, one part um, noise in your data, essentially. And uh, don't drink and derive, bro. I have a story for you at some point. Uh, thank you for following. And also Dineshi, thank you for following. Uh, KNN is, is great. It can be so strong, but it can be so computationally expensive. And that's why when we go over anomaly detection, I'm gonna show you some, uh, some, some, some fun things that we can do with, um, with KNN to make it lighter weight, to make it move faster, to avoid the difficulty of storing all of that data in memory. 10, yes, he's a very good boy. We might skip the 10 song tonight because usually the Tennessee singing requires me to move down my green screen. I have to put everything away. And at uh, ye old butt crack of dawn, I have to be having everything all set up. So lazy me who doesn't like mornings was hoping to have uh, to leave my stream set up like this so that I can just sleepily sort of walk in here, sit down and talk about math to high schoolers without having to set up my green screen. So I'm gonna leave it up for today. Ten is also probably sleeping like a very good boy. Um, but for those of you who are like, what's this about a song? You can check out songs from Tennessee. We have plenty of clips. I think that's just the one that I have as a command. But if you look at the stream Twitch clips, he sings a lot. Um, all right, so what other questions before we wrap this up, friends? 
Uh, low phone, can you find us someone, someone tiny, some, someone tiny to raid, please? Mmm. Jolty, don't go anywhere. I've got a book for you. Hold on. So, where is it? Oh, this is, this is, this is a great introduction to machine learning. I have too many textbooks. I have a thing about textbooks. They make my knees weak. All right. Oh no, well, that's kind of cool. So it looks like there's some, there's a green circle here. Thanks, green screen. This is like, this is, this is excellent. This is widely regarded as a great, great, great textbook. Um, it's got lots of the math for you, lots of probability and wonderfulness. I have not been through the entirety of it, but if you want the deep dive into the math of machine learning, this is a great place to start. So this is machine learning, a probabilistic perspective. Uh, Kevin Murphy. So, uh, thank you for following Anna Zizi. It's me, Mayo, thinking about stuff. Wel welcome to the stream. I know, right, Major Lift? He's, he's a very good boy. And Wednesday, I promise, we'll come back to Tennessee singing. He usually wraps up my streams for me because he's a very good boy. Um, but today, at least, I need to leave my stream set up. And he gets cranky at me if I try to put, uh, if I try to put him on my lap. He like, he doesn't really like to, uh, he doesn't like as much to be, to be confined that way. So, he is, he's a very cute bean. Um, but check out that book. It's really, really great. Um, I also have a bunch of other textbooks if you want specifically like good Python introductions or you want more about reinforcement learning, which is the thing that I'm in love with, um. But in any case, thank you, Kappa Votes, The Cellar Door, Major Lift, Indifferent Ghost. Welcome to stream. Thank you so much for following. Let's raid someone and tell them all about how amazing machine learning is. I have been a really small stream for a while now, so I like to raid uh, small streams as well. So please, please, please try to stick around. Give people a follow. Give them some love. Spread the machine learning wonderfulness. Um, what are the math skills you need to bring with you to understand this book? Probably calculus and some basic statistics, I see Yogi. If you stick around the next kind of event, but probably long-term stream series I'm working on is Math Mondays. Um, those are gonna be unlike kind of my more casual streams, more like this where I've prepared stuff. Um, and we'll be just, we're gonna be learning math together and we're gonna start, we're gonna start early. I'm gonna start with like algebra one, okay? And fill in those gaps, break down the fear of math. Let's have fun learning math together. That's probably the next big thing I'm planning for the next year. Um, so don't be afraid if you're not ready for that textbook, stick around, we'll learn the math together and then you'll be totally ready to, to tackle that book. But in any case, please, please, please stick around folks. I know raids are tough. You don't really know the person, um, but thank you, Pawn Noobs and Win Yo. We also do games, so thank you for following. Let's let's raid Pumpkin Days and let's say hi. Tell them all about machine learning. All right, let's bring some love to a small channel. Okay, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Bye, friends.